some curry with uh, cauliflower rice. So it's not rice, it's cauliflower. And um, some stir fried vegetables that came out of a bag. And eggplant with um, tomato paste and garlic. That's all. It kind of really livens up the uh, eggplant. Yeah. When you put the tomato paste and garlic on it. Had some of it. Was it yesterday we had it? Or was it earlier? Mm. I can't remember. I don't know. Like but, um, if you want, I can weigh out some of the tomatoes and you can have them on the meal too. Do, would you like that? I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Save them for sandwiches or something. Because, yeah, I'm, I have the tomatoes here to weigh out, but I don't think we need them. I have the tomato here. Well, you see, I didn't feel like weighing that one because I had to cut the bottom off because it oh, got, got blossom and rot. Oh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. But most of the tomatoes yeah. are pretty good. Most of them do okay. It's the darker tomatoes, like um, those black, what do they call black tigers? Or? I don't know. I can't remember what they're called. I just know that there's some in my house. Yep, and the uh, Cherokees, we almost always have problems with Cherokees. Oh, yeah. But I like them. Yeah. It's nice to get a variety of tomatoes. I think you'd maybe get a better mixture of uh, yeah. nu nutrients, possibly. And, uh, well, I don't know. Mm. Like with the blossom end rot, you can prevent it by increasing your calcium or increasing your pH of your soil. And I grow the, like that one came out of the peat bales. Yeah. So when I get blossom end rot on the peat bell stuff, I'm like, eh, because I know the peat bells are going to be more acidic than I really should have to grow tomatoes in. Yeah. So what I can do is I can increase my um, both my calcium and my pH by adding oyster shell to it, which I often, you know, in the spring I'm rushed to get things out and I. I really should take the time to do it, to add the, that to the scales, but I... Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the thing Maybe is... Maybe next year. Yeah, exactly. So Can't anyway, like I know, things. I know what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do. I just, um, I figure, well, if I get some blossom end rot, eh, what does it matter? Exactly. A little bit of, you know? If I if I were wanting to sell the tomatoes, well, I'd have to really worry about that because that's not sellable. Mm -hmm. And with Cherokees, um, I didn't have a problem with them in my bales actually, and I don't know why. In James's yard, though, they split like all the time. But this mm. year, when they split, they just healed back up again. Yeah, that was funny. So I thought they were gonzo or panzo. Uh -huh. It was quite a while back. Maybe a month mm. back. Almost several weeks back. And it might be just the dark color that you know, with the heat. Maybe they, maybe that's why they split. They just absorb too much of that sunlight. Maybe if we tried covering the tomatoes up. I I, I don't know what it is. I'm not terribly worried about the splitting if they heal up. Because mm -hmm. we're not selling them. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't bother me. You must think I'm just such a slob. Because I'm wearing my filthy house coat again. You well, you were, you were cooking it. Yeah. So, um, I get it's food like a, a good recipe book, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's a good one if it's got... But I did wear clothes earlier today. On. I went out into public and... Um, You're going to review the library again? 
You might not in public. But in the treats. Oh, I'll do that. Because mm -hmm. I was going to review the that public truck. That is interesting. Yeah, you're going to review that later. I can review the uh, public enterprise, uh, different public enterprise. Mm -hmm. What I was intending to do. Mm. Well, go ahead. If you want to. Well, I wasn't sure whether I had more to talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Or none. Well, you can talk about whatever you want. Right. I don't want to talk. I have a couple of reasons. Uh, Charlie Watts died sometime in the last 24 hours or so. Mm. He was, as I guess, uh, 80. Right on the bottom. Mm -hmm. yes, that's what they were saying. Can't necessarily trust them. Here's the CBC coverage. What do they call it, Q? Uh, Tom Power is on holiday. He might have done a better job. But uh, I generally like Tom Power. He's a good guy from, I think, from Newfoundland. Hey, Newfoundland, if you're watching. Thanks for sending Tom Power up. There's a few people I can stand on CBC. It's great. Oh, yeah. I'm getting to hate listening to CBC more and more. Every day, it's terrible. So this is the way they start the memorial services. It was for, as it were, for Charlie Watts, a guy who embraced the rock and roll lifestyle. And I'm just going. I'm. How do I make a cowardly amends for what they're saying to basically the world? Charlie Watts. I think of all the. Rock and roll. The people who made it in big rock and roll groups embraced the rock and roll style lifestyle the least. I can't think of anyone. I, there probably was someone who was more down to earth and shy. I really didn't care that much for rock and roll. I wouldn't say Charlie Watts hated rock and roll, but he much preferred. I'm saying much preferred jazz. Listening playing, probably collecting records or whatever, what are they saying, <laughs> like watching videos of jazz performances, someone went to interview him, I guess in a hotel maybe, maybe he's at home, and there he is watching jazz videos, dressing, you know, way back when. When my brother got high tides and green grass, I think that would have been put out in probably late '66. Something like a big hit thing. Pretty earlier in their career, putting out big hits thing. But uh, you know, I can remember Brian Jones dressed in what would have been then flashy red corduroy pants. Mick Jagger was wearing something that looked almost like ballet slippers. Not quite. They dressed like mods. And uh, Keith Richards was wearing striped pants. And then Charlie Watts, as I recall, he was kind of, he always seemed to be seen. There got to be exceptions. But dressed in a suit. And yeah, the Beatles were dressed in suits back then, up until 66. I think he, their last concert was maybe the last time they wore matching suits. You can see it in Candlestick Park, 66. I think they were wearing narrow collars, I'm not sure. But and the Rolling Stones were the ones, I think, that broke the mold for pop groups. They'd wear different things. They weren't wearing matching suits. And it was like turtleneck sweaters or... Yeah, you, whatever. They kind of dressed down. Well, Mick would dress like a mod with all fancy schmancy and so on and so forth. But it wasn't the suit thing. So Charlie was more conservative in the way he dressed. And... Uh, 
It wasn't flashy. It wasn't like uh, John, um, Bonham for uh, Led Zeppelin. You know, that was a little bit later, but big and loud. I think the worst drug you ever really got addicted to, you might have tried some stuff, is uh, nicotine. You look at them and uh, give me shelter. Every so occasionally, the camera stops loving uh, Mickey. And uh, it was Charlie Watts, and you see Charlie Watts just can't stand having the camera. You know, some people don't want a camera on them, right? I do that too, so. There are some cultures where the people lick the plates. Our culture, we lick the plates. See, this is the, this is the multi cult. If you think that's rude, well, you're rude to us because you're not respecting <laughs> our little culture. Mm -hmm. I believe we in, have stopped caring about what you think about us, really. Well, love uh, it or love well, that's uh, that's part us. of being a multi cult. You know, like I believe in um, the multicult there are or there should be almost eight billion cultures out there there should be everyone should have their own culture and not try to visit their cultures on other people so mm -hmm. when you get a couple of cultures out there well, maybe there's three of them. Have over a billion people involved? <laughs> well, that's not what I think of multiculturalism. Squatting on people. So I'm not singling out any individual culture. Not picking on anyone or any group of a billion plus people. But can't you think of something more original to do? Please. I'm saying please. I mean, nice. Getting back to Charlie Watts. So here they are, right at the beginning, mischaracterizing. Totally. Embrace the rock and roll lifestyle. Just the opposite. In the movie Gimme Shelter, you can see he's kind of like chewing on his fingernails. He's nervous about it. Doesn't like being on camera. The one thing he would have embraced is the money coming in. I'm not saying he was cynical about it, but uh, I think he liked having a little estate out in the countryside. I think he maybe ran a horse or two on that estate. So they had some guests on, and yeah, that person that they uh, the first. had on just before you. Uh, left for the library I said I bet you that's sugar blue and they said at the end thanks sugar I think that was sugar blue he's a harmonica player and he had maybe some maybe one insight he generally said he was always in the pocket I'm going yeah what does that mean he was maybe always a little bit behind the beat like they were saying not so much maybe as, as Ringo Starr. And uh, so Keith Richard apparently said he puts the ro role in our rock. Now Keith Richard, they say they work together. I'm telling you right now, where I established the beat for the Beatles was in Ringo, Ringo Starr. He said one time, about being in concert when he couldn't hear the Beatles, but he probably did it anyway. He'd watch the front men to keep the beat. I suspect he was hearing the front man. It really mattered. The guy who kept the beat together, from what I can tell, the Beatles was Paul McCartney. He ended up being a pretty darn good bassist, bass player. 
from what I can tell, the guy who kept the beat together for the Rolling Stones was the, aside maybe from Jimmy Page, the best white rock and roll guitarist. And that's Keith Richards. He just loves the beat. And he loves it so much, he always seems to be on the beat for a little. It's like, it's just like a vicious dog. He wants to chomp the beat. He always seems a little bit ahead, but he's always right on time. I don't know what it is about him. So Sugar Blue, they said, they asked him. Like, they started off the thing with honky-tonk women, with that cowbell book. And uh, that was supposed to be Charlie Watts's exemplary moment. <laughs> Pauline said, "I've never something like I, I didn't, didn't even hear it. I didn't, drums. and you yeah, were being directed to hear them." Now, the one thing I said is, "You got that kind of lazy cowbell going," and then, yeah, yeah when the drums come in cowbell. right at the beginning, you you kind of maybe notice the difference. It's, it it sounds really deep, you know, the cowbell sound kind of tinny or something like that you kind of hear it but it's not charlie it's just the production thing i don't know who was working on that glenn johns was awesome every time you ran across glenn johns engineering something and then later producing something it sounded glacial i'm not talking about slow i'm talking about how picture perfect it was like it's like a vermeer painting it's just like icy cold perfection and there's something about that. I don't care. I like when he sat down with Rod Stewart. I think he uh, had some stuff to do with Never a Dull Moment. I mean, Rod Stewart stuff sounded kind of like uh, a little bit clunky. But <laughs> Glenn Johns on it. Or did he work? Did Glenn Johns do the work on Baby Blue by uh, Badfinger? It's just, it, I, did he do some work with some, some of the, uh, the first Eagles album? I can't remember all the stuff he worked on. But Glenn Johns, if you're watching, thank you. You produced and engineered some of the best rock and roll moments. I am not worthy. The rest of us aren't worthy. Glenn Johns, thank you. I think he started off doing work with the Beatles. But, uh, yeah. So they asked Sugar Blue. I mean, I hear all sorts of other things on that thing. I, a lot of it's thanks to Ry Cooter on uh, honky tonk women but i i hear the the horns i hear uh is it a fiddle that's in it i'm not sure i know there was fiddle on byron berlin or whatever his name was died recently i think it was on the country honk, honk version of that on the let it bleed album but uh and the thing that everyone hears is the it's the guitar Bop. Ba ba! I, I presume that came from Glenn Jones. Another thing I want to correct: they were saying Keith Richards was a like a free spirit. He was he had his own guitar, his own guitar tuning. Is they said sorry, open guitar tuning? That's right. But it's his own. He took off the top spring. He uh, that's not his own. He got that off a of Rye Cooter. And where did he pick it up from? It's from the Let It Bleed sessions, and it was it was uh, on Honky Tonk Women, 1969. He ripped that off of Rye Cooter. Eh? So get it straight, CBC. Do your homework. I mean, uh, it's easy to do this uh, sort of stuff. You don't do your homework when it comes to politics, when religion, uh, when it comes to uh, social. Uh, uh, sociology you don't do your homework now tom power generally does the homework so uh, get some better replacement for him or something like that jesus god i hate to sound like uh, who used to say that I, I think it was hunter s thompson he, at least he used to write it. so uh yeah so they finally get a moment out of, out of sugar blue at the end they say can you think of some moment that epitomizes Charlie Watts for him? And he said, he took a while thinking, and he actually thought, thank you, Sugar Blue. He said, sympathy for the devil. And I'm going, say what? And then they started playing sympathy for the devil. And I hear the drums. I'd never really heard them before. This is from someone who actually played with the stones. I'd heard like the congas, 
you know the, the the stuff to make it sound kind of like tropical or something like that and i always heard keith richards i presume he played this stuff on the track when you see uh, on the uh, track that was released when you see the uh, uh film produced I, I think it was by godard i don't know if it's even called sympathy for the devil you'll see keith richards he's on the bass he's not the regular bass player and <laughs> you know anytime i'm not saying anytime but most times when you're hearing a rolling stone uh, to cut with a uh, jumping bass. It's Keith Richards. You know, I can remember uh, there's a group in town here in Lethbridge. I was encouraging them to move away from the country kind of classical rock and to get into some rhythm and blues. And they, I was always crying out, play a whipping pose. Uh, that's by the Almond Brothers. And I say, can you do some stones? And I don't know. If I was the one who suggested it, or I think I suggested Live With Me, but they might have picked it up off of, again, off a lot of lead. And you remember their lead guitarist said, man, you wouldn't believe how jumping the bass part is. And I'm going, I've known about it. I'm not going to say the guy's name. We'll say D. I've known about that since I got the album back in, uh, I didn't get it right away, but it would have been about 71. I've known about that jumping bass part on Live With Me. And I, then I returned the favor and I said, so do you know who uh, played that part? And he said, well, uh, he didn't know the name. Uh, he was their regular bass player. And he would have been talking about Bill Wyman. I said, nah, -uh. their uh, rhythm guitar player, that's Keith Richards playing that jumping part. Same thing, I, I, I suspect, with the release track of uh, Sympathy for the Devil. But yeah, thank you, Sugar Blue, because I'm listening to that beat. And it, Sympathy for the Devil is not like, you know, like, uh, was it John Bonham? You know, like with, uh, you know, Charlie Watts played drums traditional fashion. You know, like playing the left hand like this, the way Ringo did, Star, and the way Lee Van Helm did with the band, you know? And you maybe can do a bit more uh, sophisticated little tricks, but you listen to that, and it kind of just like clips along. And it's uh, working uh, with the congas and, and stuff like that. I'm going, Sugar Blue, that wasn't an obvious sort of thing, but yeah, that would have been maybe more to Charlie Watts' taste. You know, he liked jazz. He loved jazz. I think he liked rock and roll plenty. Plenty and well enough, but his real love in life, aside, I think, from his wife. I liked it. Here's another thing. Rock and roll lifestyle. Back in about 66, the Stones got together, and they were asking, you know, like, how many uh, chicks have you banged? That's probably, the, I don't know if that was the term they used. And uh, so, of course, who came out number one? Everyone guessed Mick Jagger. <laughs> Bill Wyman, oh, he was gross looking even after he got all sorts of plastic surgery. <laughs> but <laughs> they had a guy who used to play keyboards with him, Ian Stewart. He died a while back, and oh, he was so bad, <laughs> bad looking, in conventional term, that the Stones wouldn't let him appear on stage with him. Sometimes he's back, I think, behind the amplifiers or something like that. He played the rock and roll stuff. They'd have Nicky Hopkins, who's a studio musician. I don't know if he ever played on stage with him. But he'd do the, uh, you know, like the... He, he probably played... Uh, like the piano bit for... Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Nicky Hopkins. That's very good. That's a much better example than I was uh, going for. Uh, she's a rainbow. I, You know, it's kind of like, sounds like Mozart or something like that. That's, I suspect, was Nicky Hopkins. But the guy who played the rock and roll stuff, just hammering away, was Ian Stewart. Oh, thank you, Ian Stewart. If people who don't like rock and roll don't care about it, I do. I'm on the verge of crying, buddy. Wherever you are. But, uh, yeah, like, uh, what were they saying about, uh, uh, char yeah. We we're talking about so Bill Wine, number one. <laughs> He's a horrible woman. I said, and it's awful. It's not funny when it get, gets beyond or below womanizing, girlizing. Oh, Bill Wyman, Bill. Oh, ugh. So ugly-looking brute. 
and uh, yeah, he had a lot of plastic surgery. And then uh, number two, it was either Brian Jones or, or uh, Mick Jagger. It might have been Brian Jones. Brian Jones is an awful person. Awful person. I suspect he was manic depressive, bipolar. But uh, you know, that just because they've got some sort of physiological uh, problem doesn't make what they did any better. Anyway, I think he was still a teenager and he fathered two illegitimate uh, children, right? And of course, he was the kind of guy who would just say, Kids? What kids? Woman? What woman? You know, just moving on. That sort of stuff. So, uh, I, it might have been something like a tie for those uh, two, uh, well, wankers, really. Brian Jones and Mc, Mick Jagger. And then Keith Richards. <laughs> it was something like four. <laughs> They've been stars for a couple of years. Keith Richards, I think, he used to be a shy kind of guy. And then he ran across a real, she died recently, I think, Anita Pallenberg. She was a real skunk, that woman. She uh, she tried to land Mick Jagger, and Mick was having none of it. And uh, then she landed with Brian Jones, because she figured he was maybe the leader of the Rolling Stones. And she got him really dressed flamboyantly. He dressed, re I mean, he apparently did get all sorts of different suits and costumes. And then uh, she figured out he was weak. I mean, the drugs were just hollowing him out from within. And so she moved on to Keith Richards. And Keith Richards might have been really the leader of the group. They kept on saying on the show that Charlie Watts was the guy who was the foundation of the group. The foundation of the group was Keith Richards. Initially, it would have been Brian Jones, who believed in the blues and that sort of stuff. And he actually knew how to read music, and he was a multi-instrumentalist. Now that I think about it, he must have been bipolar, eh? You know, like the, 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 the tendency towards killing himself with drugs. The, the ability to read music, to And he was younger, I think, than uh, not just the two old uh, guys in the rhythm section, but younger than Mickey, and I don't know if he was younger than uh, Keith Richards. Keith Richards might have been the youngest of them all. But the ability to play, you know, they, they say he just, they gave him a recorder or something like that and just learned to play it in a day. It's probably pretty easy to do, but, uh, you know, like, it's not, not something I could do. So, I got to respect that. Anyway, uh, And then they got to Charlie Watts. Well, it's, it's lower than four, you know. And they said Charlie Watts is a virgin. That's what I'm saying. Now, I, I, I think he was. Uh, he might have even been married at that point in time. But so they, they were making the joke. It wasn't working in threes. It was working in five. So that's the number of guys in the group. But uh, I think I like to think at least that Charlie was uh, faithful to his wife. You know, I think she was kind of like blonde. Was she maybe from Scandinavia or something like that? I'm not sure. But I, I like to think he was. And I, I, at least he probably wanted to be faithful. You know? And it probably was easier for him than, uh, than, let's say, someone like Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend, I think, wanted to be faithful to a very beautiful woman that he married, but at least to be beautiful in conventional terms. And she was the daughter, I think, of a classical type of composer. And he wanted to be so much that he'd actually take a caravan out on tour. Caravan in, Eng in English terms is a 